want the gas as cold as possible. But to break the tar, you need to get about 1,000 C. Okay, so you're trying to make sure your combustion temperature here stays over 1,000. But it's also, it's a, it is a temperature and resonance time relationship. It's not just a spot high temperature. You've got to get a certain temperature. The higher temperature, the faster the stuff breaks. The lower temperature, the longer it takes. But usually say I get over 1,000 C. <coughs> But you want it. You want it. After here, the gas isn't doing any useful work um, in principle in the reactor. It's a problem now that it's hot. It's making everything after this difficult, okay, which is the beginning of why gas, gas fires become these huge plant scale installations with all these different components. We've got cooling problems to solve as well as gas making, the particular problems to solve. Um, and then you have tar removal problems to solve if you did solve the gas. And our main strategy here is let's solve everything in the primary reactor to get rid of all the downstream components as much as possible. So let's not accept that we make tar, so let's fix them in the reactor, which we don't need elaborate filtering or our tar cracking devices. Um, let's do all of the gas cooling by heating the, the, the incoming air and fuel feeds. So we essentially cool by heat exchange into the intakes just so we don't need the coolers and radiators. So right now here I'm showing the air. We go along here, we'll show our heat. So between pyrolysis and combustion, do you get any or much tar buildup on the walls of your reactor? And what, what are your best results in terms of tar percentage <coughs> uh, coming out of the exhaust gas on the end? Well, what was the last one? What are your lowest uh, tar figures uh, when you run the uh, gasifier experimentally? OK. Um, Tar condenses at around 300, 350 C, so you'll, you'll see it wherever your temperature moves or passes that point above it, you can get on uh, tar condensation. But also, what's going on in the toddy is it's controlling the migration of that tar. The, the toddy, like L architecture, that's also to separate the drying and pyrolysis, so you don't get the pyrolysis gases going up into the hopper or to any significant degree. Just the hopper stays clean. Take a traditional inward gas fire that has a hopper on top of it. Um, you open it, it'll be filled with junk all around it. You have this convective flow of tar gases going on. Okay? And we're trying to progressively make the hoppers clean. But you can't get bad gas out of them. Um, you, don't get, you don't get tar out of them. You don't get CO. You look at World War II, people are filling things are like in a huge smoke. Okay? That's not a, that's acceptable. So we're trying to do a lot that you can fill this without getting exposed to any smell, any gases, whatnot. And to do that, you have to get out of that vertical um, um, architecture or add air locks um, uh, in related problems. And, and how low can the output gas Oh, OK. Um, the most important thing is operationally about what it does to the engine. The only numbers, we did a bunch of tar testing, but the numbers were the qualitative do with visual things. And we were we were relating temperatures in here to tar production. So our tuning method, our control method, now uses those maps that we came up with about how much tar was created at specific major temperatures in here. And we use that to predict tar performance of the reactor um, and use it to control the gas. So we, we had a very operational definition of it. Um, the only real numbers we've got was some a project at Colorado State University, and they came back with 100 milligrams per meter cube um, in the gas at the reactor before the, before the filters. Remember, the, the big black sheet over gas gasification is really, are you solving the problem or is moving it downstream to the filter? Okay? So you can find systems that will give you very, very low tar numbers, or actually First of all, whenever you're talking tar numbers, you need to distinguish between what is it at the end of your reaction, your reactor, and what is it at the end of the filtration. Okay? So you can have an infinitely complicated filter train that can get it to very, very low levels, but usually at the cost of destroying the economic and operational proposition of the equipment, um, as well as the size and the form factor and transportability and all that stuff. So, um, the literature would usually say to run an engine, you need to get the, um, 
the gas below 50 milligrams per meter cubed. Um, we were at 100 out, out the, the reactor, but I mean, that also could vary by the temperature and flow rate and whatnot. But I was very pleased with that. And then we're dealing with the rest of it through the filter. And depending on how well you pack the filter, it can do almost nothing, or it can do lots of good things. But a filter is necessary. Yeah. So an updraft, I mean, for reference, an updraft gasifier <coughs> will produce, um, I think it's in the realm of uh, 1 to 10 grams. I need to pull out the number. It's, it's either a 10 or 100 times increase. Um, the, 100, the 100 number I was right. OK? So I gotta get going. So no, not too many more. One more question. Given size, fuel, uh, the process, the air experience basically scales. Yes and no. There's certain things that scale linearly. Other things that if it's don't. In terms of chemical reactions, your material handling problems don't scale linearly. Um, you have know, all sorts of different things that happen. Uh, in material handling. Um, what we use to build things changes as you scale. Uh, so it's your whole building pallets and what's, what's the solutions are you drawing from the hardware or Yeah, I get all of that. It's more uh, basic. So the question you had is uh, double the output of that device if you scale it by factor two. Well, it, it would quadruple if you double the, the, the uh, diameter. That gas fire out there is double. The one with 100 kW is double the, uh, the one we're using here. So instead of having a 15 inch um, uh, gas count, it's a 30 inch diameter gas count. Okay. This is all based off of scrap tanks. During the beginning of the gas project, I was very interested in having the capability to make, make the exact thing that we were making in house out of junk and junk. So the design we came up with, we realized by welding together scrap tanks, or buying our sheet coming well in, or getting the dutch in. So all of these vessels are, are based off of common tanks that you find in the world. So it, our design is relevant for you know, DIY hacking as well as over manufacturing. And we're starting to have to force from that a bit to do what we want to do, but still all the fundamentals are based off of it. Okay. And that's all these to do because tanks are based off of common material size in the world. And this 15 inch diameter tank has a uh, piece of sheet metal four feet wide, roll it, uh, you get about 15 inch diameter. That's what pro propane tanks 100 pound propane, 100 pound propane tanks. That's what that is. Okay? Okay, so that's the four processes of gasification drying, pyrolysis, combustion, reduction. The problem is that's wrong. Um, that's actually not how it works. Or, well, it does work like that. It's just not quite enough. There's more things going on. Okay? So, ring three. Gasification is stage combustion in five steps. We have a new step here that's never called out in gasifiers, which is a problem because it's actually uh, it's a more important route for creating your outgoing hydrogen and carbon oxide than um, production. That fifth process is cracking, cracking the target gases. Okay? Biomass gasifiers have a very distinct problem versus a, a coal or a charcoal gasifier in that the original biomass is about 20% fixed carbon and about 80% volatiles. But the fixed carbon becomes charcoal. All of that volatiles becomes tar gas. Okay? Your problem is that you have way more tar gas out of biomass pyrolysis than you do charcoal. If you're working with coal, it's about reverse. Coal has, it's all over the place, but on average, let's say it's about 80% fixed carbon and about 20% volatiles. You have a lot of the, the, the raw carbon to work with, and a relatively small amount of the tar. The volatiles that take the tar. Now, in biomass, there is some, there is some variation in those ratios, but it generally stays around <coughs> uh, 28. Okay? If we could redesign biomass for gasification, we wouldn't want it to be in those ratios. We want it to be much closer to 50 50. Or ideally, we really want it to just grow as charcoal. Charcoal is really easy to get. Play charcoal gas fires. Most vehicle gas fires in World War II that really worked were charcoal gas fires. 
Because if you have a charcoal gas fire, you make, um, you run pyrolysis before on the biomass before you use it as a fuel. Can you get rid of all of the balls and tar? You just have the charcoal. Okay, so you're just running combustion and reduction to make your gas. You're not having to deal with the part of the process that makes that makes tars. Okay, so we don't want to make charcoal down the run until you lose 80 percent of the about 80 percent of the energy. It's actually um, you want to use that. You want to do interesting things with it and make the charcoal stay in gas. Uh, a slight majority of the gas is coming through this cracking process. Okay, that's not seen until you do the mass balance. So that's the fifth process, the cracking process. So I've called it out on the chart here. Um, extra process between combustion and reduction. Okay. Now the problem with that is where are we doing the cracking in these things? Air is coming in, combusting the tar gas, and somewhere in this realm we're doing the cracking. Now the cracking, for cracking to work you need high temperature and you, and you need time. The problem is any amount of combustion that we, we do here to generate temperature is also creating a CO2 and water vapor that starts the reduction reactions. The reduction reactions are pulling heat out. Okay? So the vessel where you're trying to have this tar gas pass through and be able to crack is a whole bunch of charcoal walls. Those charcoal walls are fighting you. Those charcoal walls are trying to run reduction reactions and drop the temperature. Okay? So the cracking vessel, the place that you're trying to maintain these very high temperatures, is a, the, the vessel itself is trying to drop the temperatures um, in the reduction reactions to make the gas. So it's, it, it's in some sense you're trying to run your, your, combust, your, your cracking <coughs> reactions you know, under a water brigade. Um, you're trying to run it in, in, the, in the environment of something that's, that's fighting you and trying to pull heat out of the system. Yes? Does a fluid bed have a problem? Fluid bed's fluid bed set up completely differently. It, it, it's basically the updraft relationships. It's not these relationships. It really doesn't have. So this fifth, this fifth process explanation really only goes on in a downdraft type gas fire. You don't get an updraft or a fluidized bed. A fluidized bed um, runs, it really even doesn't run the, it mixes all the zones together. It's, I mean, when it's first starting out, it's kind of in the updraft form, but it's, that's actually incorrect for me to say that. Once it gets going, it, it tends to stabilize at about seven to 800 C, and it runs all of the, the, the reactions mixed together. Okay, you get some stratification or localization of the things, but you, you have fairly consistent uh, temperature situations from the bottom to top. Okay? So, um, this is why downdraft gasifiers are so sensitive to the fuel size. Why they need that big chunky fuel is to create the void space um, between the chunks where the gas can, can flow down through and be creating these uh, cracking conditions. As the fuel gets smaller and smaller, you get more contact between those gases that are trying to crack, the CO2 and the water vapor, with the walls of the charcoal, thus your re reduction reactions happen faster and your temperatures drop faster. If you put a small fuel in the gasifier, all of this stuff constricts down. Your combustion reduction happens much faster up here. So you have a much higher surface area. So the large fuel essentially is to, it, it slows reduction down. It, it, it reduces the amount of surface area that you have such that the reaction rate of the reduction slows and gets slow enough such that the tars can exist in the high, high temperature, um, you know, open volume long enough to crack and then pass down through the bed. If they don't have adequate temperature and reaction time or cracking time, they're going to also pass that down through here and still be TARS.